Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here and welcome back to the railway. Today I'm reviewing a new diesel shunter by Hornby. Last year, Hornby released their brand new 88 horsepower Ruston shunter, and you can see the first version they released back there. And I actually really enjoyed this model. It was surprisingly affordable for a new Hornby Loco. And while it wasn't as fancy and feature packed as more expensive new releases, it still looked fantastic. It still had some decent details to it. It was high quality and a fantastic runner. Plus, of course, it didn't break the bank, which was a real nice change for a new Hornby release. However, that livery was not that inspiring to me. It was in a BR blue and a perfectly good BR blue at that, nothing wrong with it, but it was not the Ruston livery that I had my eye on from day one. That one has just been released now and I've got it into review today. So the loco I really wanted was this version, the North British Railway version. And I think you can tell just by looking at the box really that this livery completely transforms the loco. It's like having a pre-grouping locomotive that didn't come from the pre-grouping era. It just looks that fantastic. So this is the same price as the other Ruston Shunter, despite having a much more complex livery. So the RRP is £113.99, so certainly quite affordable. And this is available at the retailers for £102.60. So just a hair above £100, that's definitely not too bad for a brand new tall locomotive. And if you'd like to pick one of these up for yourself, I do have affiliate links down in the description. So if you want to get a really decent value loco plus support the channel, you can do that. But for now, we're going to take a look at this Ruston in the North British livery. Can't wait to see what it looks like. So let's get started. So I'm really looking forward to opening this box to see what the actual model looks like because I think the photo on the front of the box looks quite washed out and the photos that I've seen of this model show a much more vibrant looking loco. So I'm quite interested to see this in the flesh. Anyway, let me show you the end of the box. So the product code for this version is R3894. It is in the North British livery and it is a Ruston and Hornsby 88 diesel shunter 040 and it is number four. And if you're interested in these Rustons, let me show you the back of the box because there's a brief history here, plus a little bit about the specific Ruston in this box. Although I will give you a little bit of history on all of this in just a second. But for now, I think it's time to reveal what the actual model looks like. Does it look more vibrant than this picture? I think it's going to, but let's see. Here we go. Not had this box open yet. Oh, blimey, maybe I won't do either. <laughs> it's very tight. Oh yes, 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 yes. All right, so interesting, I'd forgotten, incredibly, how tiny this was, just having looked at this picture on the front of the box. Yeah, the photo doesn't appear to be in scale with the actual model. The real thing is a little bit more dainty than it. And yet, in terms of color, you can see this looks way more vibrant. It's a really, really good looking livery. All right, yeah, just look at that. Just imagine the BR Blue from earlier. And then look at this, it looks like a completely different loco. And yeah, a lot more complexity on this livery as well, which I can't wait to look at up close. All right, so let's pull out the instructions and take a little look at these. So this is for the 88 diesel shunter. I'm not gonna go over this in too much detail because I did in the previous review, but you can see this is where you oil the loco. Removing the body to DCC fit it is reasonably easy as it's screwed on. There's a little look at the chassis, although I will show the mechanism later on. And uh, yeah, it does have the six pin DCC socket on board, which allows you to chip this quite easily. And that's pretty much all there is to see. So any accessories? Yes, we do have some. And the instructions do mention what these are. So let me show you that very briefly. So it's pretty simple in terms of accessories. We've just got the pair of NEM tension locks and then these kind of plugs which you can put in instead of the tension lock and that will make the buffer beam a little bit more realistic as it won't have a gap in it. But uh, yeah, that's it. Everything else is pre-fitted to the loco. So let's take a look. First question, what is the finish like? Let's see. All right, so 
finish is a little bit flat. Hopefully you can see that it's not really catching and reflecting the light there. If it was a bit more satin, perhaps a little bit glossier, then it would do that more. So it's not the highest quality finish in the world, but uh, I can't help but notice already what a wonderful, wonderful livery this is. So let's lift this up. Gosh, yeah, I'd forgotten how weighty these models were. Absolutely insane. So yeah, there's a lot of metal on them. The sort of running plates and lower body of the model, that is all die cast made of metal. And then the cab as well is a metal piece too. So it's a really, really heavy model for its size. And if it's anything like the BR Blue one, that will make it a really decent puller as well. The livery is just incredible. It really is so, so complex given the size of this thing. And I'll show you much more of that in just a second. Let's pull in the BR Blue one though, because it looks significantly different to this one in terms of the detail. Yeah, you can see, especially around the running plate area, this North British one is completely different, and so are the buffer beams and such. So that explains why it's taken so long for this North British version to come out. It's not just the exact same thing, just painted differently. They are quite different models in the detail, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of those differences too. But anyway, let's have a little bit of background on the 88 diesel shunter, and then we'll have a close look at this new model. Ruston and Hornsby Limited were a company from Lincoln who were founded in 1918 and were best known for manufacturing narrow gauge diesel locomotives. They also built a range of standard gauge locos too, one of which was famously modelled by Hornby some years ago, that was the smaller 48 diesel shunter. The 88 diesel shunter was a more powerful shunter than the 48, delivering 88 horsepower rather than 48, and the first one was introduced in 1938. Though the engines were larger and more powerful, they shared many of the same features as the earlier 48 Ruston, and this included the drive mechanism and running gear. As with the 48 diesel shunter, the 88s were not fast, only capable of speeds of up to 15 miles per hour, but thanks to the higher power of the Loco, they could haul over 500 tonnes. The most powerful versions of the Loco had a few tonnes of additional weight that could be fixed to their buffer beams, which could increase their tractive effort if needed. In total, 271 of these were built between 1938 and 1967, many of which still survive today under preservation. And this example was built for the North British Distillery Company in 1958, and it still exists today, having been restored into the North British Railway livery. So there it is, up close and personal for you, the beautiful Hornby Ruston 88DS in the North British livery. And as you can see, the livery on this model is definitely its key feature. Absolutely love this livery, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. Generally speaking, I would say it's a decent looking model with a smattering of the usual Hornby incompetence, which is a real pity because this model otherwise looks fantastic. But yeah, there are some gaffes here. The major gaff is the rear windows, which as you can see have been painted over. Now I've had to look this up because I just can't understand why Hornby would have done this because clearly that is not prototypical. You could not run a diesel shunter with its rear windows blocked like that because it would just be completely dangerous. So what apparently happened was when Hornby surveyed the real loco to create this model, the prototype had some boards placed over its rear windows just to prevent vandals from smashing them. And yet somehow Hornby didn't figure this out and they produced the model with those rear windows blacked out. Now that's baffling because a 10 second Google search can reveal that those boards are not a permanent fixture of the Loco and so a working model of the Loco really shouldn't have them. And I think this is really the thing about Hornby. If the TV show Hornby A Model World is anything to go by, Hornby's designers consist of a lot of young kind of university graduates who are great at design, but who really don't know railways that well. And gaffes like this suggest that not only do they not know railways very well, but that there's also nobody left at Hornby who would pick up on this stuff and say, hang on, that needs to be adjusted. I think that's the big difference between, say, Hornby and Rapido, let's say, who is made up of real railway enthusiasts who know about these things and so are better positioned to create realistic models. So there's that. 
The other thing is, yeah, the paintwork up close really isn't that great. And the reason for this is, again, I think down to a basic error. And that's because this yellow paint on the body has been painted directly onto the much darker green paint. Now, anybody who's ever painted a model or, I don't know, even painted a bedroom or something, knows that if you're painting a light colour onto something dark, you're going to need a couple of coats or you're going to have to do something to prevent the darker colour showing through. But here on the model, particularly around these grills and also up on the bonnet of the model, the green is clearly showing through and it leaves the yellow looking a little bit murky in places. And in other areas like the cab window, you can just straight up see the green through it. Now, again, this is the sort of thing that the team at Hornby should be picking up on. They're supposed to receive samples, look for this sort of thing, and feed back to the factory so that the final models look better. Why such a basic issue has been allowed to get through, I just couldn't say. It's very, very odd, and to an extent it does spoil an otherwise fantastic looking model. The other thing like that is these door handles. Now, as you can see, they're not separately fitted or separately picked out. But even worse than that, they've just kind of got the lining from the side of the cab door just printed over them, which looks really, really bizarre. So again, this is the sort of thing that you would expect to have been picked up during the sampling stage. Why this has been left looking kind of bad like this, I have no idea at all. So again, attention to detail is really something that Hornby should be looking at trying to improve. So rant over, let's now look at what the model does have. Let's talk about the decoration then. So the finish isn't the greatest. I think this could have done with a coat of satin or something like that, just to elevate the finish and make it look a little bit more metallic. But it is easy to overlook that because of how great the livery actually is. So the service doors on the side have the lining around them. That's just the white lining which looks excellent. And then the top of the bonnet here has white and red lining on it, which has all been applied beautifully. And the side of the cab also has this lining on it, which looks truly, truly excellent. The underframe is pretty complex as well because these panels here are done in the black and they've kind of got a red border around them, which looks a bit like lining. Just makes the whole thing look incredibly complex. And of course the axle boxes really do have lining on them too. Even the wheels are painted into the yellow, and you can see this is what the yellow would look like if it wasn't painted onto the green. It's actually a completely different shade. So yeah, it's definitely the fact that this has been painted onto the green that makes it look like this. Around the front, we have the buffer beam, which looks quite a bit different from the BR Blue Rustin. So yep, yeah, you can see the tooling variations here, and the running number on a lined plaque has been painted onto there. Around the front, we've got no wasp stripes as per this livery, but we do have the Ruston nameplate on here, and you can see the relatively decent looking moulded detail on the grills there, which I like very much. Here is the North British lettering, which looks like a quality print, but it's done in a yellow instead of the metallic gold that it should be in, so it doesn't look much like the real thing. Insert another comment here about poor attention to detail. So let's talk about the detail then. Now, unfortunately, no screw or chain link couplings were provided with this model. So yeah, it is quite basic in terms of features. And that is a theme with these models, which isn't necessarily a problem because they are pretty affordable. But it is important to note, I think, that this is not as complex or as feature-packed as other more expensive models out there. So this isn't cheaper because it's better value. It's cheaper because you get less for your money. So we've got that, we've also got the buffers, which are made of metal, but they're not sprung. Plenty of people happy to forego sprung buffers for a better price, and this model is a good example of that. Also, sadly, no lighting on here. We do have the indication of a lamp at the front and also the back, but there are no LEDs or fiber optics in there to make these lights work, so they are just dummies, unfortunately. Similarly, the handrails around the cab, these ones are just made of plastic, unfortunately, so they're not quite as robust as they would be if they were made of metal, and I suppose they're slightly more inclined to warp as well. Although the handrails on the bonnet here, these are made of wire, and they feel much more sturdy too. So I think where possible, the handrails have been done with wire. I think it's probably due to the shape of this one that it's been done in plastic, but I suppose that's fair enough. In front of the cab, we've got a small amount of pipe work here, which is separately fitted, as well as the horn, which isn't painted into a metallic colour, as I think it should be, as per this loco, but I think that's a relatively minor thing. 
And then on the underframe, you can see we've got some detail here, which looks pretty good. We've also got the sanding pipes and the brakes, which have also been pre-fitted. The cab area has this glazing on the windows, well, where, where it's not been mistakenly painted, it does. And there is some interior cab detail as well. It's the same detail as on the BR Blue version, as you might expect, but it is much more detailed than on the 48 horsepower Ruston that Hornby made, which had very little in the way of cab detail. So for a budget model, this kind of detail is awesome to see, although I would have liked to have seen maybe a cab light in this model, just to illuminate it a little bit, to show off the fact that this logo does have that feature. But there you have it, that is a close look at the Ruston. I think, yeah, generally, obviously, this looks absolutely gorgeous. It could have been made better, though, with a little bit more attention to detail and, frankly, just more careful research on the prototype. Gaffs like this really shouldn't be getting through when there are people whose job it is to make sure that these models are made as accurately as possible. But anyway, yeah, generally a decent model. The weight is fantastic. It comes in at, well, it's the same weight as the blue version, so 126 to 127 grams, thanks to the die-cast sole bar here, and also the cab sides here, which are also metal. So great to see Hornby putting some real weight into these models. Makes the thing feel so much better quality as well. So with that, let's talk briefly about the mechanism and also let's get this thing running and see how this performs. I'll be quite interested to see how the performance compares with the BR Blue version that I tested last year. So let's get started with that. And let's see how it goes. So there it is down onto the track. And, you know, I have criticised aspects of this model, but I want to make it clear I still really like this thing. Even though the livery's not been done in the best possible way, I still really like it. And looking at it from this kind of distance, it looks fantastic. It really does. Anyway, I filmed the initial running test and also the running in, and I'll show you how that went in just a second. Next, let's talk a little bit about the mechanism. So, as you'd fully expect, the model does have all-wheel pickup, which is good to see. So that means each of the wheels has a wiper pickup on it, so it's as reliable as it could be. Although there is no extra wagon with this model, which has additional pickups on it. I think that's a pity, really, but understandable for the price. I did notice that straight out of the box, one of the base keeper screws was extremely loose. In fact, it was only kind of half the way in. And when I put the base keeper back on, I tightened this screw up fully, and the model actually runs a lot quieter now. So if you've got a sort of vibrate runner, just check that the screws aren't loose, because that really quietened mine down. Anyway, the base keeper plate is hardwired on, which I guess is a cost-saving measure, but it's fair enough because you can remove the base far enough so that you can access the axles and also the pickups to clean and service those, so that's not too bad. As you can also see, the axles sit into proper separate bearings, which is really good to see. And because there's no rods on this model, both of the axles are driven with a gear, which is pretty rare for Hornby, so there's a fun fact for you one of Hornby's very few locos that has all wheels driven with gears. Body removal is nice and simple with this one because it's held on with four screws and the body comes off in one single piece, which is great. Here is the chassis, which is die cast and decently heavy, although the motor is just a three pole motor, unfortunately, and it has no flywheel. I think in this day and age, some sort of quality coreless motor or perhaps even a small five pole motor would have been better in this loco, particularly for a shunter, although the motors in these models do work fantastically, although the crawl, I think, could have been better with a better motor. And then here is the DCC socket. It is a six-pin socket, but it's not really fixed down anywhere. It doesn't have a proper place to go. It's just kind of floating, almost as though it was an afterthought. So it's a pity it's not built into the chassis in some way, just so that it's got a proper place to be, but at least it's got one, I suppose. And then I filmed myself putting the NEM couplings in, so I put a tension lock in the back, that was fine. The blanking plug, for want of a better term, really didn't fit in though. Uh, again, I think it's because the fit is just so tight, and because the part is painted, it just really doesn't fit. With maximum force, I was able to get it to go in in the end, although it really is stuck fast now, and I don't fancy my chances of getting that back out. So I would think carefully before you insert these, about what you want to do with this loco and only put those blanking plugs in if you're happy for them to stay put. If yours is anything like mine, that is. 
and then the gauge comes in at 14.2 millimeters back to back which is a little bit looser than we've seen on some but that does mean that this is going to handle tight curves very nicely so can't speak for the couplings on tight curves but for the loco itself sub r1 i think is going to be okay for this so yeah the mechanism is okay i think for the size of the loco it's definitely not bad although i think mainly it's the motor slightly better motor I think would have done this loco proud but otherwise a fairly decent mechanism so with that let's jump back in time and let me show you how this loco ran so the br blue rustin that i've got was a great performer it was nice and reliable although it did struggle on some of the larger points so we'll have to see whether this one is the same but first things first let's see if this works at all so forwards direction here's a little bit of juice here we go All right, yep, it is working. And I'm going to let this run in completely, so 30 minutes forwards and then backwards before I review the actual performance of this thing. But straight out of the box, this seems to be a beautiful performer. It did go over the express point, albeit at a slightly higher speed, without stopping though, so that's pretty good. And uh, that hopefully will improve as it goes on. Seems to be really capable of doing a nice slow speed. Obviously, in real life, 15 miles per hour was about the top for these. So it's really good to see that this isn't racing along like a Hornby train set 040 would. Yeah, that's really good. Let's have a look at the actual speed then. So I'll run by at 50. See what this is like. This may speed up a little bit as it runs in. But yeah, that's certainly not too bad. And more importantly, for a shunting engine can this crawl again this might change as it runs in but straight out of the box can it crawl here we go easing up a little bit more sorry twitch okay so at the moment it is capable of going pretty slow but it's kind of struggling to maintain it it's stalling and cogging a little bit a little bit more maybe i think it has cut out there that's good though that's nice and smooth okay let's keep going is it going to stop on the points i think the answer's obvious yeah there we go so this axle is now over the dead zone on the express point and it has stopped um, obviously these are large express points and the dead zone is pretty large on them as well so if you're running express points it's going to be a problem if you've got other points though which have smaller dead zones or electrified frogs then I would expect this loco to run better on those. Obviously, this loco does not come equipped with an additional wagon with pickups in it to improve the reliability. That's what the smaller Hornby Rustin 48 diesel shunters had. This one doesn't, nor does it have a socket for you to plug something like that in, which is a pity. If you are going to chip this with DCC, though, I would recommend some sort of stay alive, which will really improve the performance of this. But anyway, it doesn't seem to be too bad. Let me see if I can get it off the point here. There we go. And before we go, obviously this is a heavy loco, so let's just see if there's any sort of torque in this mechanism. And I think there will be if it's like the blue one. Here we go. Up to 50. Yep, as you can see, plenty of power in the mechanism despite all the weight of the chassis and body. So there we go, nice little runner. Let's run this in and see how it gets on around the track. Off she goes. All right, so there it goes, half power. That's a good pace, I would say, for a Rustin. You probably wouldn't want to go much faster than that. But it's nice and smooth and reliable, not too noisy, and it really does look fantastic in this livery. I think up close, as we saw, the livery could have been a little bit better. From a distance, though, taking it all in at once, yeah, it looks really fantastic. It is definitely my favourite of the Hornby Rustin liveries for both this model and also the smaller Rustin as well. Yeah, I just love this livery. It's so complex. All the panelling is lined and everything. The colours are really cool as well. Yeah, it's just a really, really good-looking shunter, possibly because of this livery, my favourite shunter as well. So I'm going to leave this to run in. It'll do 30 minutes forwards like this, then 30 minutes backwards, and then we'll come back and couple this up to some stuff and see how it gets on with a load. But yeah, so far, seems to be a good performer, just like the last one was, which is good to see. Okay, there we go. That is running in complete. And yeah, it's now running even quieter than before now that I've tightened up that loose screw. 
Not sure what the deal is with screws sort of halfway put in place. I don't know how that happens. Perhaps it got loose as it ran though, maybe. But again, if it was tight, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, that was fine. Absolutely fine. Obviously, no derailments. And at 50% speed, at least, it did not at any point cut out on the express points. Can't remember whether that was the case or not with the BR Blue one. Um, but yeah, this certainly will cut out on them at slower speeds, but at the half speed setting, it did it without any problems, which is awesome. The pulling power is a bit less than I was expecting. It's 0.14 Newtons. I think I got 0.2 something last time, but I've measured this many times and I've also re-measured the BR Blue one. 0.14 seems to be right. So perhaps last time I didn't properly calibrate by Newton meter. I don't know, but 0.14 seems to be right, which is about 12 coaches on straight and level track, which is still really impressive though. I mean, that's more than a Hornby Peckett and they are kind of renowned for how incredibly powerful they are. So yeah, pulling power, absolutely fine. Let's see if the crawl is any better then. It was able to go pretty slowly before running in, um, but it wasn't ever so smooth. So let's try it again now. Ready, forwards, turn it up gradually. These motors, despite being three pole, usually do give a pretty good crawl. But yeah, that seems to be about the slowest I can get it to go. And as you can see, it's not very consistent and it's also quite a, quite a coggy runner at that speed. Which is a shame because when a shunting loco can really crawl like one hair width at a time, then it's just so much fun to run because you've really got maximum control over it. This one, as you can see, is pretty good. It's able to go fairly slow, but it's not that smooth and it's not quite as controllable as some. So I guess that's fine because this is a budget loco. So it's, it's okay, I suppose, that it's not the best crawler in the world. But generally speaking, ignoring the price, you want a shunter to be as good as possible at the low speeds. And this one's just good, not fantastic. But yeah, that's fine. And at the higher speeds, obviously, well, as even as sort of high as this, it becomes really nice and smooth. So yeah, it's great. Has it gotten any faster now? Let's check that out. No, I think that's about constant. So yeah, maybe that looks like a little bit higher than 15 miles per hour scale speed, but it's geared well enough so that it can do those more realistic speeds and yeah, looking at it like this, it's perfectly good. So yeah, a good runner, not the greatest in the world, but certainly for the money, it's more than adequate. So I've set up a genuinely massive freight train for this loco, just to show that despite me getting lower readings than I initially said, it's still a really, really good puller for its size. And I'm pretty sure it's gonna manage these without any problems, but we'll see. So with that, like I say, I've got the NEM coupling in there now. Let's back up and check that the coupling is at the right height. And I'll try and do this nice and steady. Okay, let's slow down even more. See how steadily I can do this. So yeah, it can do it. The crawl's not bad. There we go, and that sounded good. Was it good? Let's see. Forwards we go. We'll go at about 40, I reckon. And yeah, it seems unbelievable really, but it's hauling them ridiculously easily, almost as though it's coupled up to nothing at all. But on the points, yeah, a little bit of a hesitation there because I'm now running it a bit more slowly. But yeah, it's certainly not too bad. Yeah, there we go on that one as, as well. That's the issue when you want to start slowing it down a bit. That's why I think some sort of stay alive would really help this one out. Anyway, on the middle line, I've got the BR Blue Ruston, which I've talked about quite a bit today. And I suppose this one is shunting a train together for a larger engine. Uh, so this has got three BR coaches. Running that one a little bit faster, only a tiny hesitation over the point there. So yeah, at the higher speeds, that's not a problem. And then on the inside line, we have what used to be my favorite of the Hornby Rustons. I think so, anyway. Uh, this is Queen Anne which is in this very, very lovely brown livery, which itself is a bit like a pre-grouping livery, isn't it? However, because of all the lining and the bold colors on the North British 88DS, I think that one is now my favorite, as much as I still like Queen Anne, of course. But anyway, let's go and check in on the North British one, and see how it handles that load up the incline. All right, here it goes. 
And notice it's not going quickly here. It's actually running really slowly. And yet it's not at the moment anyway showing any signs of slowing down. There it goes around the second radius over which it doesn't slow down. And there it goes. Look at that. Powering its way up Gordon's Hill there. So the weight is really, really impressive. I don't know why Hornby made this as heavy as they did. I'm not complaining, but usually they are ones for sort of fitting plastic bodies so that models aren't really that heavy. And yet here we've got a relatively budget model, which has got all that die cast on board so that it weighs an absolute ton. It's, it's unusual, that's for sure. But I'm glad they did it. That's made this model feel really, really good in the hands. And of course, it's allowing it to do this as well, haul an absolutely insane amount of rolling stock. So overall, I don't think this model is going to win any awards in any category. It's not got that many features. The level of detail is relatively basic. The mechanism is average and the performance is good without being particularly outstanding. However, at the same time, it did not break the bank. It does work well. It does look OK. For all of these reasons, this is actually one of Hornby's better models, I would say. Yes, there are Hornby Locos out there that are massively more complex than this, and they've got working lamps and sometimes smoke generators and sound and all this other stuff, but they are insanely expensive. In terms of bang for your buck, I think this has to be one of Hornby's better value models. Now, for the money, I would have expected this to be better in a couple of areas. I think really there's no excuse for the windows at the back being painted out like that. A little bit of research should have revealed that that's really not how a model intended to run should be represented. And there's also things like the way the model was painted. Yeah, really, those samples should have come back and changes, I think, should have been made. But at the end of the day, it's lovely to see Hornby producing some more affordable offerings that are not so basic as to belong in the railroad range. So that aspect of it, I can praise completely. And I think I've probably said something similar in the BR Blue Rustum review, but I would love to see Hornby do more of this. More models that are kind of somewhere between the railways and railroad range, which are still good looking and modern, but also not insanely expensive. I think that is something Hornby should and could do a lot more of. And now some ratings for the Hornby Ruston 88DS in the North British livery. The level of detail I've given two and a half star. Now I don't think this is supposed to be a super premium, highly detailed model. And that's because it doesn't have any lights, it doesn't have sprung buffers, doesn't have any couplings for you to fit onto the hooks and such. It is very light on features. However, this one does have a much more complex livery than the BR Blue version that I looked at last time, and I was going to give this a higher score for that. However, the attention to detail in the livery really isn't that great. We've got the windows at the back which are blanked out, and I don't believe they should be. You've also got things like the finish not being as premium as on some models, and also things like the door handles on the side of the cab, which have just got the lining slapped over them, making it clear that they're just part of the moulding. So I've given it the same score as the BR Blue Rustin. It's also getting the same score under performance. Yeah, there really isn't much of a difference here. It's still the top quality performer that the BR Blue one was. Yes, it will stop on the express points at the lower speeds, although it's managing fine at the higher speeds, which is good. And it's not a brilliant crawler either, which is a pity for a shunting loco. That said, it's certainly not bad, and even though it's not the greatest at the very slowest of speeds, it's still going to be a capable shunter, I reckon, particularly on DCC with some stay alive. That would almost certainly be better. The pulling power comes in at 12 coaches on straight and level track, and as we can see, that is enough for this thing to haul an enormous amount of freight, probably quite a bit more than would be prototypically accurate, so no way to fault the pulling power, absolutely brilliant. The mechanism is a three star for me. It does have some high quality features such as the all wheel pickup and the separate bearings on the driving axles. However, it doesn't come with the additional wagon to assist with picking up power. I think that's a pity. It doesn't have a five pole motor or a quality cordless motor. It's just a three pole motor. And it also doesn't have a flywheel or any proper place for the DCC decoder to go. The socket is just kind of loose on wires floating inside the body. Even though the base keeper plate is hardwired and not attached via spring-loaded contacts, it's still a serviceable model though. You can still get access to everything and you can still remove the body quite easily, so I've not marked it down for that. 
The quality though for me is really what lets this model down. I've given it three and a half star, which is less than I gave the BR Blue Rustin. So on the plus side, this is a seriously heavy model with a lot of metalwork on it. So you've got that diecast sole bar slash running plate that weighs a ton and so does the cab being made of metal as well. So the weight is absolutely fantastic for a model of this size. It's also been assembled pretty well. There's no visible glue despite the relatively large number of separate parts on this. However, on the downside, we've got the paint, which isn't the best. We've got light colored paint on top of darker colored paint and the dark green paint does show through in a number of places. We've also got the odd alignment issue where the yellow doesn't quite match up to the lining and the issue with the door handles, which I've also mentioned. So yeah, it's not gonna get the same quality mark as the BR Blue version did because up close, you can really see the cracks in the paint job. Value for money though, I think for just over £100 at the retailers or £102.60, you do get a lot for your money here. You get a relatively detailed logo, yes not the most complex one in the world, but from any sort of distance I think the detail is certainly enough. It's an interesting model because of the livery and the performance is more than adequate. So I think for this day and age, just over £100 or £113.99 at the most, that's the RRP. Yeah, this is a pretty fair loco. It's not a bargain because the low price is reflected in the lack of features that the model's got. But overall, I think it is pretty much worth the money. So overall then, that is 7.08 out of 10. That's slightly lower than the BR Blue version because of the slightly poorer quality. And the grade is an E. Now the grade boundaries have shifted since last year. I think the BR Blue version would be a D if it was marked again this year. And that's because I adjust the grade boundaries every year based on the previous year's stats, just so that I get an even spread across the different models I review. So yeah, it's not the greatest in the world, but for beginners or those on a budget, it's absolutely fine, particularly if you can get an example that has been painted to a higher standard than mine. Into the logbook we go then, and it is ninth place, so not doing too bad really, above Hornby's Class 08 and below the New York Central Hudson. I think because the price isn't ridiculous, I could recommend this loco. I'm quite happy to see lower spec models produced, provided the prices reflect that, and I think in this case, the price very much does. Well, there you have it then, folks. That is my review on the Hornby 88 horsepower Ruston in the North British livery. I apologize for doing another 88DS review, but I thought this livery was so different that it justified a separate review. And I'm glad that I did it because in addition to the livery being different, we've got those tooling variations as well. We've got the running plate and the buffer beams looking completely different on this example, which is not necessarily something I realized was a feature. So glad that I got another one to show that not all of these Rustons are just the same thing, but with a different paint job. They do actually have some detailed differences as well to make them even more realistic, which is cool. But for now, thank you so much for watching. Do let me know down in the comments what you think about this. Do you have one of these North British Rustons? How was yours painted and are you satisfied with it? Do let me know. But for now, thanks again for watching and I'll catch you on the next one. All right, cheers folks, you take care.